and voila, it says, Doris, you did it. See, there you go. Congratulations, Doris. I have learned about sustainable fashion. Now, what what did that just do? Well, for if you this is something everyone also has has access to as a member of the Drawdown Eco Challenge, you can go to your dashboard page, select impacts, you can look for the organization that we are all within. And um, we have completed almost 3,400 actions. Our goal is 10,000. And this one that we're doing right now falls into the category of the number of minutes spent learning. So I have just added, and you will all add, 45 to 60 minutes spent learning after you learn about sustainable fashions. And same thing for learning about solutionary rail, although that would be under a different category. And just so you can see the impact that our entire organization has had, we have eliminated um, over 1,800 pounds of CO2. Um, we have contacted 79 public officials or leaders about drawdown solutions. And, you know, if we follow up on solutionary rail, then um, and, and put in the number of officials we have contacted, um, then, you know, this number will increase even more and our actions, our number of actions will increase and we will be at 10,000 before the end of, Jan of June. Yay. There's two of us and the, the, the issue is, uh, or the subject is solutionary rail. And this is the uh, 101 version. Uh, as I said, I'm Gary Pies. I'm president of Whitby Environmental Action Network, a long time uh, UU, a long time member of the UU Ministry uh, for the Earth. Um, and you'll learn more about me. My uh, path to climate justice began with uh, and was fueled by many bills. The first one was Bill McKibben, who wrote The End of Nature, which I read shortly after it was published. And that was my verification that all this crap we're throwing into the atmosphere uh, is going to have consequences. I grew up in Motown. I put myself through college working for uh, Ford Motor Company and for a while Chrysler. Um, I'm from the land of the automobile, but never was a big fan. I've been uh, uh, committed to climate justice for uh, decades. I founded the uh, 350 Whidbey, co-founded the Sustainable Whidbey Coalition, Whidbey General Hospital's award-winning green team, I initiated the climate justice uh, section of the Northwest UU Justice Network, uh, started with a friend of mine, the Climate Reality Education and Advocacy Team, or CREATE, um, which uh, was a compilation of a friend who uh, uh, graduated from uh, Al Gore's uh, training, the Climate Reality Project, and we combined it with uh, education and advocacy and took it into, well, anybody that was listened, but the most uh, the greatest part of that was the school system. Um, social environmental justice co-counselor leads at UUCWI with my wife, blah, blah, blah. And the, uh, another bill that's played a big role in my life is Bill McPherson, a phenomenal policy wonk. Um, and I've led efforts in our uh, county for um, Passing a carbon tax uh, twice, uh, which failed, uh, I-732 and 1631, of which I'm wearing the shirt. I don't know if you can see that because I can't see me right now. Uh, here's what it boils down to. We have a train system of which Bulgaria would be ashamed, James Kunstler. Um, it's very antiquated. Uh, you'll learn more about just how antiquated it is. Uh, the world is moving ahead with electrification, 
for instance, um, I think Europe is about almost 60% electrified. Uh, Switzerland, 100% electrified. The entire Trans-Siberian Railroad that crosses a continent is 100% electrified. Uh, here in this country, we are 1% electrified. And the reasons why this is uh, gonna be a problem are going to be explained. Meanwhile, who else besides me is on board with Solutionary Rail? Well, some very deep thinkers. Um, a brilliant solution is how Tom Hartman captured it, well-reasoned and comprehensively documented, a jumpstart to an energy transition that has already worked in other countries, but not reinventing the railroad. Uh, Ralph Nader, I'm sure you're familiar with him. And Dennis Hayes, who started, who has organized the first Earth Day, of which we had the uh, 50 year anniversary uh, last year. Electrification is not only our best option for passenger rail travel, but also for rate travel, uh, rate uh, or freight rail. Um, and it is uh, another link in the pathway to just transition. Uh, Tom Gold, Goldtooth, executive director of the Indigenous Environmental Action Network, is a strong supporter, as are representatives for uh, railroad, lab, uh, railroad workers. And um, it's an important route as identified by um, the climate, uh, climate groups uh, who know about it, as this is an example of. Uh, and it, it has, a, as you'll find out, comprehensive uh, impacts on many, many, uh, many areas. I, I'm trying to get away from the use of the word stakeholder because of its uh, colonial connections, but uh, rail passengers, of which my wife and I have been uh, 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 utilize, been, uh, and will continue to be, are strongly in support of solutionary rail because it will de uh, decompress the rail system for more efficient passenger rail use, um, as we'll find out why in a moment. But uh, uh, this is a very important issue for entering the age of consequences, the mid 21st century as gracefully and um, with as much resilience as possible. And I'll just finish with this quote by none other than the uh, president of the American Meteorologics Society. Solutionary rail shows that once again, railroads can lead the way from a fossil fuel based society to a society dominated by renewable energy and more energy efficient commercial transportation. And that's a, uh, so this is my opportunity to, to welcome my good friend, activist, and um, profound thinker, dare I say genius, Bill Moyer. He's the executive director and co-founder of the creative activism organization called the Backbone Campaign, which was founded in 2003. Backbone has been an innovative force for developing and spreading artful activism, such as kayaktivism, where you see them here, light projection, innovative bannering, and other creative tactics to bring a little art and attention to um, issues of importance. To augment Backbone's opposition to, to the use of the Pacific Northwest 
as a fossil fuel corridor to Asia, Backbone initiated a strategic campaign to advance a positive vision for U.S. rail. Bill and his team co-authored the book, uh, Solutionary Rail, a people-powered campaign to electrify U.S. roads and open corridors for a clean energy future. They were inspired to do this after a couple of oil trains uh, carrying highly toxic uh, petroleum products from the tar sands and Bakken oil fields uh, blew up, one of which killed 47 uh, people in Quebec in 2013. Um, the Sulichulary Rail Team, aka the Hive, is buzzing with multiple efforts to get policymakers and public interest organizations to put rail at the gravitational center of their just transition strategies. Possessed or obsessed, or possibly both, Bill is passionate about refining and propelling solutionary rail forward. And I want, uh, I'll turn the, the microphone over to Bill and stop sharing. Thanks, Gary. Appreciate it. Appreciate the invite and the introduction. Um, <clears throat> Gary, uh, when you, you're done with your screen, I'm going to share mine. Hi, everybody. Uh, Backbone Campaign, as Gary uh, described, is a movement building organization. And so, We've been very much engaged in saying no to lots of things, you know, lots of bad stuff. And um, I can, um, I'm going to hope, I'm going to share. And I like to say that, uh, you know, our we have to balance opposition with proposition. And that as we oppose things, uh, we need to propose. And so, uh, you know, I think that our no is only as powerful as our yes is compelling. So I, I, as folks who have probably been involved in lots of sorts of movements, um, I think you could probably get that. So, uh, so as Gary described, we came out with the book in 2016. I think that the easiest way to introduce uh, Solutionary Rail is to, um, to show you a three minute video. Um, yeah, that's better. You yeah. got that now? Got our it. Our no is only powerful as our yes is compelling. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Okay, cool. Here we go. Solutionary Rail, a people-powered campaign to electrify America's railroads and open corridors to a clean energy future. Our vision is to electrify major rail corridors for faster, cleaner trains that provide a more reliable service for people and goods. We want to draw high-value cargo off of roads and back onto the tracks for highly efficient transportation and near-zero carbon emissions and we envision opening rail corridors for the transmission of renewable energy, unlocking stranded wind and solar assets, which will not only power the trains, but also the communities they travel to. The United States has the largest economy in the world, yet its transportation infrastructure is overloaded, underfunded, and crumbling. Meanwhile, we are failing to provide solutions for the most pressing environmental and economic needs of the 21st century. The taxpayer-subsidized highway system built in the 1950s triggered an exodus of freight and passengers off of the trains and onto cars and trucks, accelerating the decline of U.S. railroads. Rail transport was forced to become increasingly dependent on moving cheap, heavy, and often dangerous payloads with longer, slower-moving trains making fewer stops and abandoning regular service to the communities that they served. Now, ever smaller crews are forced to work without schedules, on call 24-7, which results in chronic fatigue that endangers workers and trackside communities. Meanwhile, semi-trucks clog ports, towns, and freeways, causing disproportionate wear and tear on our roads, killing thousands each year on freeways, and polluting the air with diesel exhaust. 
The rest of the world is overcoming these problems by electrifying their railroads. Many countries in Europe and Asia have made massive investments in publicly owned railroads that rapidly transport goods and people. Unlike national railroads of other countries, U.S. freight railroads are almost entirely owned and operated by private companies maintaining their own tracks, unable and unwilling to make the large long-time investments for electrification and track modification. Solutionary Rail addresses these challenges through a tax-exempt, not-for-profit Steel Interstate Development Authority, creating a public-private partnership with railroads and other stakeholders to finance, build, and operate the electrification and transmission infrastructure. Our vision champions the needs of numerous stakeholders for rail workers, minimum crew sizes, set schedules, and improved working conditions. For passengers, decreased travel times through higher speed rail networks. For farmers, increased capacity for bulk commodities and faster, more reliable service for moving perishable crops to market. For tribes, right-of-way justice, energy sovereignty, and export opportunities. For trackside communities, reduced air pollution from diesel exhaust. For green energy developers and rural electric co-ops, new transmission opportunities and access to distant customers. For the railroad industry, increased market share of high-value freight and long-term vitality. <coughs> and for rural communities, an opportunity for access, economic renewal, and cultural vibrance. Solutionary Rail is a people-powered campaign for sustainable transportation and a clean energy future. And now we need you to help move this people-powered campaign forward. All right, cool. We're going to keep it going here. So everybody, you can access that video and get a free download of the 2016 book at solutionaryrail.org. You don't even, and there's a, there's a, all the information is on that page to, uh, to down, get your free copy. So we don't need to, don't worry about that. Um, so I'm going to try to be as, as swift as possible. And I've tried to take some of the gritty details out of here, but so our effort and the reason I am kind of obsessed about this is because we're trying to tackle with Solutionary Rail a couple of the most difficult aspects of, of decarbonization. Approximately, at least as far as nationally, approximately 30% of our, our climate emissions come from, uh, from transportation and another 30% approximately come from electricity generation. So decarbonizing both of those is a, is a big challenge. So what we're trying to do is take on actually the hardest aspect of each of those. So you can see in this uh, pie chart that in terms of transportation, about a quarter of it is from heavy, medium and heavy duty vehicles. So, uh, and you know, a relatively small portion is from railroads. So in the last number of years, we've actually started to really and begin to emphasize, yes, electrification, and we start with mode shift. So anyway, rail, greenhouse gas emissions currently represent a relatively small portion. Heavy duty vehicles are far more significant. Mode shift of long haul freight from roads to rails is therefore an important component of our transportation decarbonization strategy. So why trains? What's a big deal? So trains use a third of the energy required by cars and trucks. And that's a conservative estimate. So just that steel wheel on a steel track is less friction. It makes them far more energetic, energy efficient. <clears throat> when we move freight off of roads and onto rails or onto tracks, um, we reduce also wear and tear on roads and bridges reduce motorist truck involved uh, accidents, Wa and we improve wa air, uh, water quality and air quality and public health for uh, in environmental justice, fence line communities, people who are, tend to be um, the communities that are poorer and people of color who are living either near ports, rail yards, or uh, these days, large warehouse districts. And of course, as you all care about with the drawdown effort, we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. So, the, but partly the, the, the bottom up a, approach that Solutionary Rail has taken has meant that we want to be, speak to the many benefits so that we can bring in unconventional allies into the effort. 
All right, getting the visitor in the office. So, thanks, Linda. So, the, there's a tool called the Freight Analysis Framework that Bill McPherson, I built, and I have looked at quite a bit. And when you look at that, you learn that about 40% of the freight that's traveling over 500 miles, 40% of the freight that's traveling over 500 miles is traveling not on uh, trains, but on trucks. And that's a problem. That's nearly a trillion ton miles or over a trillion ton miles of freight. A ton mile is a ton moved a mile. So that energy, uh, or the, it takes to do that, times one trillion. So what does one trillion ton miles mean to us? It means like hundreds of billions of gallons of diesel, tens of billions in wear and tear on US roads and bridges, uh, millions of metric tons on greenhouse gas emissions, CO2, uh, tens of thousands of premature deaths from diesel pollution, thousands of freeway deaths, and tens of billions in costs of congestion, all of this every year. So it's also nuts that this doesn't actually, um, that, that our country doesn't actually have a great tool for assessing that problem. We've got all these different like transportation and environmental impacts tools, with calculators and stuff, but we don't have one that puts all that together. In Europe, they take this very seriously. They have actually combined the data from multiple countries to do a, a study called, um, and, and to create this thing called the internalization, uh, uh, internalization Handbook. And that's by the shift to rail, uh, it's called a joint undertaking. It was uh, commissioned by the European Union to do this work. So, and when you take a little peek at one of the bar graphs from their study, you see that the impact, these are HGV, that's heavy gauge vehicles, large trucks. Um, and you look at something like accidents, there's far more deaths and caused by those than there are by rail. The air pollution impacts, this purple band versus this purple, it's much greater from heavy duty trucks. The climate impacts, of course, much greater. Noise, much, anyway, they, on and on. So one of the things we're undertaking is the creation of a true cost calculator for freight transport and urging our national um, agencies to connect the dots on the data they have so that we can actually characterize the problem and make smarter public policy decisions. So <clears throat> when you think about a 40% of that freight is traveling on trucks rather than trains, that's a lot, that's a big chunk. A trillion ton miles is a, lot, is a big chunk to, take, to deal with. So, um, that's why it's pretty clear that mode shift, what we, shifting of which mode of transport something is utilizing is a, is a public interest priority. And that's why we've, I start, for instance, these presentations by talking about mode shift. Okay. In 2020, uh, we worked on a paper called Moonshot Mode Shift because we were trying to get the select committee on the climate uh, in, uh, to include mode shift in their uh, uh, climate action plan. They did not. They basically punted on mode shift because I think they're very, uh, everybody's a little bit intimidated by talking about freight. Sadly, we don't tend to know a lot about freight in, in the public. And in, that includes, that translates up to government levels and, uh, and taking on the railroads when you don't really know what you're talking about is kind of a big deal. It's pretty, it's pretty intimidating. Um, so here's another expression of that trillion ton miles. If you take this, these last five bar graphs and you see that pur dark purple, that's all truck travel. So when you see these numbers down below, those are miles. So set 500 to 749. Uh, 750 to 999 miles, 1,000 miles to 1,500 miles, et cetera, et cetera. So all of those, the dark blue or purple, or this, no, this dark blue, is, um, is uh, freight that is traveling on trucks. Our mode shift, even if we just talk about the stuff over 500 miles, is, uh, is where we would make, see that, that all of that is traveling by rail. So how do we do mode shift to rail? Things like 
on dock rail where the trains go directly to the dock or using this technology we call RORO or roll on roll off technology. It's been used for many decades to get trucks immediately off the roads and onto tracks. Um, like literally onto tracks, not, not just the cargo, but the trucks themselves where appropriate. Um, and then a lot of it is about protecting the short line railroads, all those branch lines that the class one railroads have spun off. Now, I should clarify, there are <clears throat> currently seven class one railroads and there's a talk of a merger of two of those railroads. Only, um, only five of them are you owned in the U are based in the US. And only four of the, the bigger, the big four are the ones uh, are Union Pacific, CSX, Norfolk Southern, and BNSF. On the other hand, there are over 600 short line and regional railroads, often the railroads that were less profitable um, and sometimes spun off in branch lines that were discarded in a way by the class one railroads. So we think that defending the, the short line and regional railroads and making sure they have access to the whole system and that they are supported uh, to, is good in and up for a number of reasons. <clears throat> and that brings me to the last bullet here about connectivity and access. So making sure that short line railroads and others uh, can have access to the railroads and that the big railroads don't put burdens on manufacturers and farmers require, requiring 52 car loads in order to have the, the train stop. Um, we'll get into a little bit more of that. Um, another thing that, uh, that it could be a big help is when the state rail plans, when the states do their mandated rail plans, that they include a comprehensive mapping and a strategy for moving freight in these sort of industrial places onto tracks. So here's an example from Nevada down below here, where only the black dot in this picture, only that black, that's the only industry that's actually putting things onto the tracks. All these other dots, even though they're right next to a railroad siding that's right next to a, 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 a Union Pacific line, are not using the railroads for their shipping. All right. Electrification is still super important, no doubt about it. It's essential for the workers and the communities and the climate. Um, and it's just a smart thing to do. Uh, electricity can come from renewable sources, right? Electricity costs less than diesel fuel in terms of like BTU to BTU. Electric locomotives are in the long run cheaper to maintain. If any of you who are familiar with like machinery and such, the more moving parts, the more uh, difficult to, to maintain. Uh, regenerative braking reduces power consumption. So instead of wasting the braking power and having it just dissipated as heat, we uh, rails, uh, trains have been doing regenerative braking since I think approximately uh, uh, 1916. So it wasn't the Prius that invented this, it was GE that put it on a locomotive. That in, the, in that situation, the, the, the braking power, some of the braking power uh, was transferred to the lines above. <clears throat> Electric locomotives add capacity through more rapid acceleration and deceleration. If you think about a, a rail line having only so many trains it can have on it, if those trains can accelerate or decelerate more quickly, that creates space for other trains. In 2016, when we got this chart, already Italy had 64% of its railroads electrified. Now, when I show you some other maps, you'll see that we don't, we're not talking about automatically waving a wand and electrifying 100% of our railroads. If we had 64% of our railroads that electrified, that would be amazing. Right. Um, so mode shift will also, once we take a bunch of those heavy duty trucks off the road and shift that to rail, that's gonna require a major increase in the capacity of railroads. And that means that it will also, if they remain diesel, um, it would Im increase their, their, um, their share of greenhouse gas emissions if they were not electrified. And we, it's a big, it's a little bit advanced, but um, one of the challenges we're facing is that the 
rules for trucks and the cleaner truck rules and truck electrification is happening. Um, they're cleaning up trucks more quickly than they are cleaning up uh, locomotives. And locomotives have a longer lifespan. So it takes a, a longer time for those uh, locomotives to turn over to be uh, more uh, efficient and cleaner burning locomotives. So um, that aside, uh, one of the important, some of the important work we've been up to is being participating in, in various coalitions. One of those coalitions is the Moving Forward Network, which is a really fantastic uh, network of community-based organizations or principally community-based organizations that are fighting the impacts of diesel on the health of their communities. And that's diesel principally from freight. Here's an example of the impact of a uh, rail yard in San Bernardino on that community. And, you know, it's not just, it's not just the communities, the workers themselves that are usually from the community. So workers and communities, we've learned to make, you know, identify as the same people basically. So, uh, but you can see how uh, the rings of impact from the diesel impact that place. And all of this is available online. I'll be happy to share this stuff with you. So how do we start with electrification? I believe we have to start by ports and drayage. Just a quick um, tutorial on that. The drayage is that short distance trucking that takes things from the ships to warehouses and other places where they, things get turned around, you know, shuffled around and put in uh, cars that go either on trucks or on trains. Um, so those short trips, could be done with electric trucks. That's a really reasonable possibility, as is the on-dock rail electrifi uh, electrification. Um, and that would be a, a sensible way to electrify ports. Places like this, the port of Long Beach, LA Long Beach is a place that's leading in that because uh, decarbonizing freight transport is, uh, is being led by, the, by California. Now, I know that's not a huge surprise. Um, Electrifying rail yards, getting the diesel switchers, other th tools that are ha used in rail yards um, to be electrified would be super important. And then to concentrate on the main high volume lines. Now, there are 140,000 miles of rail in the U United States. So uh, just out of, for curiosity's sake, the Department of Defense uh, designates uh, approximately 40,000 miles of those as a strategic rail corridor network or StrackNet. Now, as, as happy as I am with the change of tone in the uh, Washington, D.C., I, I do want to say that I, I don't like the fact that we just in the U.S. can't help ourselves, but pick, always picking a new enemy, you know, uh, it, and, and it's, you know, from the, uh, from the Cold War to the War on Terror to now, you know, China. I, we, the Department of Defense has been warning us that climate change is a national security threat. I think that would be a fine enemy to identify and take on, and that would uh, help us justify using some of the tools we have as first for national security and re, uh, dedicate them to solving the climate crisis. Um, excuse me for a sec, Bill. This is Doris. Um, yeah. We have about five, five, six minutes for wrap up before we transition to our next presentation. All right, I'm gonna, okay. So anyway, uh, I think another place is to do electrification, electrification would be main lines like the Northern Corridor, the Southern Transcon, um, et cetera. And it could be great jobs. And this is a, a, a train that was used in Europe to do that. The last piece of, of about uh, solutionary rail is the idea of transmission, using the corridors to do uh, to unlock renewable energy from the sunniest regions and the windiest parts of the country, in order to get them to. Um, I'm going to skip through this side slide, but uh, to do efficient transmission uh, from point to point transmission using HVDC or high voltage DC that uses railroad corridors and existing rights of way so that we don't have to wait many, many you know, years for uh, uh, eminent domain fights, et cetera. There is talk of the national grid and that's an important uh, thing that's coming up with the Biden administration. If you see, this is a NOAA study from 2016 that uh, outlined how our 
a rail grid, a DC, an HVDC grid would get us to 80% renewables by 2030. I like to juxtapose that with a map of rail corridors just as a way of taking a peek at the similarities and how the usefulness. And dealing with that could help us deal with some larger problems that have to do with rural, chronic rural depopulation, some of the divisiveness in the country, expand passenger service, and um, uh, utilize our rural electric co-ops. It also gives tribes a way to play a leading role in renewable energy generation and export of renewable energy, as well as renegotiating some of the bad deals they got in terms of the easements of rail and, and um, transmission corridors that are crossing their land. So I think I'm going to um, try to go to uh, the last thing, like, well, why wouldn't the railroads want this? Well, sadly, the railroads have been kind of taken over by Wall Street. They're all very obsessed with lowering operating ratios and short-term profits. They're, they're doing very, very well, uh, billions of dollars each year, while they reduce capacity. And the problem is we actually want them to increase their capacity. They do greenwashing like LNG or... They're going to do a battery locomotive, but a battery locomotive by itself isn't a great idea. Battery locomotive plus catenary overhead lines. We're not talking about third rails in this situation with freight. We're talking about overhead lines and batteries. That's a great combo. So um, I'm going to I'm going through this a little fast here. The, 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 the class one railroads basically say, we're private, leave us alone. Well, you know what? They were given a bunch of land and they are national infrastructure that's critical to the, our well-being. So I, I liken their stuff to being the, the Jedi mind trick. We're not the droids you're looking for, but I think they're exactly the droids we are looking for. Um, and we need to be pressuring them. And um, because our public interests are served when 100% of those trucks going 500 miles are, over 500 miles are, uh, that that freight is on rails when that freight is electrified and when the railroads share right of way with the national super grid. All right, um, so I'm gonna skip through a couple, few things, but I want us to make sure that we, as we're doing this work, that we remember that, uh, that rail, interstate railroads are common carriers. They should be treated like utilities and it's time for us to update our 21st century obligations for how they serve the public interest. All right. And there are lots of ways to do that, which we won't get into, but I think it's important that we also know that we can't do this alone. And it's not just gonna be climate activists who do this. So we have to appeal to all the folks that you saw in the video so they can be allies in this work. So I think that the, the new administration has a great team of folks, but I think they need to talk to each other. I, don't, I think interdisciplinary problems deserve interdisciplinary solutions. Uh, and I would encourage you to encourage them to do to work together to find those solutions and utilize this interdisciplinary approach to problem solving called solutionary rail. Um, we have a lot of resources and I'm not gonna go into the different things that have been cool lately, but here I'm gonna share my contact info and you can um, uh, copy, take a screenshot if you want. And, um, and now I'll, I'll answer questions. Chat too, Bill. Huh? Go ahead and put it in the chat too. I will do. All right. So oh, if anybody has any uh, burning questions, that would be a great time. I do hey, have some burning questions. Beck has a question for you, Bill. What? Go, go, go so ahead. Beck, Beck has a burning question. Yes. <laughs> Where is your leverage point? Who are you trying to convince first to do what? Well, first we're trying to convince Congress, uh, like the, the Commerce Commission and the uh, Transportation Commission, that they need to update the common carrier obligations of the Class 1 railroads. Uh, the, the Service Transportation Board is the, is the entity that the railroads and, and, the, and the importance of freight in their work. Uh, and then the, the, no, there's, the a question, there's a question here about is, is uh, labor supportive? Uh, rail labor is very supportive. There's also, we've been working with United Electric, which is a, a union that actually builds rail uh, cars, locomotives. And they've been uh, working us, with us on their green locomotive project uh, and uh, introducing us to folks like uh, Chewy Garcia in his office, uh, uh, representative from in Chicago. Uh, uh, the Teamsters, 
don't really have very much penetration in long haul freight. So it's not really gonna impact them very much. Uh, they are actually very opposed to uh, precision scheduled railroading, which is what the railroads call their uh, uh, obsession with uh, lowering operating ratios and, and uh, to increase short term profits. So I think labor is, uh, is gonna be strongly supported. What, what about agriculture? Well, you know, um, what we've seen in Kansas, for instance, is that the short line railroads are really important for getting stuff onto the main lines. I think agriculture, you know, they've been at fighting with the railroads since the Granger movement, right? The Granger laws were the first regulatory, regulatory laws to take on the railroads monopolistic power. And so um, reinvigorating that uh, passion is also something that's, I think, critically important and making sure that local places, small manufacturers and small growers have access to the mainline railroads. And, and it, how great to learn about the regenerative braking since 1916. That's, know, that's right? you know, smart. Um, my, my question would be like the, the major truckers, um, and not necessarily the heaviest stuff, but like Amazon, FedEx, um, yeah. Some of those guys, are, are they on board and how, how, how is this transition coming along? Who, well, I, I, let's be clear. We're a movement building organization. We don't, we don't stop with the start with the corporations and work down. We start with the people and work up. So um, uh, that would be, you know, not letting Bezos get away with greenwashing his, his climate pledge by uh, electrifying the, the last mile vehicles, but actually forcing, we participate in a, a, a coalition called the Athena Coalition at, and, and sit at the environmental justice, climate justice table in that coalition. And um, our point in there is to, we want folks like Bezos to look at the entire supply chain. And actually we'd very much like to see a shopping cart in the shopping cart of, of Amazon to have a true cost calculator so that we understand the actual cost of prime or next day freight. And we can, uh, and so customers can start to make choices that don't uh, undermine other communities, et cetera. But, uh, but yes, it would be great to have, uh, to, yes, for the true cost of freight to actually be represented in the prices people pay or the options that they have. Um, not sure if that adequately covers your question though. And, and I don't think the trucking companies are gonna be super excited about this, right? We're talking about taking a trillion ton miles of business from them. But you know what, what we've also learned is, is that people have studied, if you raise the gas tax by double or whatever, even if you made it so they actually paid their fair share of the damage costs, shippers who can't get reliable service from trains are gonna stay with trucks. So we need rapid rail, we need fast lanes. We don't need 250 mile an hour trains necessarily, except for in a few places in the country. But what we really need is we need 110 mile an hour trains. We need trains that are, we need to lift the bottom speed as is at least as important as, low, as raising the top speed. And so, um, and, and reliability is the number one right there with cost uh, for uh, consideration for shippers. And shippers are pissed. Shippers like you, um, U.S. Grain and Feed Association, they are mad at the railroads because they're being uh, neglected. The railroads, are what they're doing is they're chasing shippers away to trucking, which is the opposite direction we need to go. And in fact, and, and just concentrating on the, the, the folks like Home Depot or Costco or just these giant corporations that can provide, fill up their trains, and then, um, but they're ignoring the smaller manufacturers, smaller businesses, and, um, and that's, that's a real problem. Yeah, I can totally see the reliability piece. Um, so, is any of this in the infa in the proposals for infrastructure, the infrastructure bill? Because I, um, we, we as Unitarians, we advocate on the Hill, and one of the next big um, uh, uh, topics we're go we're going to be um, advocating on is infrastructure. And so, finding a way to work this in to put it into the to the minds of all of our representatives, um, I, I would love to um, get some sort of fact sheet or, you know, something simple that yeah. um, would help convince people to, to, like, take a couple of steps within the infrastructure bill to get this moving. So if you could help with that, that would be incredible. 
Yeah, I'd love to have a follow up with people who are working in that area. Um, this has been a little bit of a constrained time to try to cover so much. It's a yeah. big learning curve. I've had to go, go up a pretty steep learning curve. And so, but yes, I think that would be fantastic. There's totally, the infrastructure bill is inadequate when it comes to long haul freight. They basically punted on it, just like the house action plan. Yeah, okay, well, I'd like to offer um, uh, Gary and Bill and the, a, a chance to make any closing remarks, as well as um, even, I, I can't see everybody's screen, but if there's one more burning question out there, um, anybody else have a, a question for Gary and Bill before we go into closing and, and opening up with Lena? Okay, Gary, Bill, um, closing, closing comments on Solution oh, Rail. You. Thank you, Doris, for making this space available. Uh, I think you'll find that if you really uh, research this, you are going to be as excited about the potentials here as Bill and I. There are so many dimensions of this that um, will improve our, our lives and uh, focus a, uh, uh, a resilient, healthier future. Focus on a resilient, healthier future. And I think Bill McPherson, my other Bill friend, would reinforce that. All right. Well, thank you all. Yeah, I, I, I encourage you to uh, let's follow up. I mean, please feel free to download the book, uh, share the video with friends. And um, the full presentation, I just pa pasted the link. This is the presentation I've been sharing with USDOT and others. So it has some specifics about uh, dealing with the Surface Transportation Board, uh, the FRA, and possible ways forward. So um, I, I hope it's of use to you. And I would embrace any opportunity to speak with you. I'll also put my phone number in the chat. And thank you very much. And I uh, thank you, uh, Gary, for inviting me and Bill for joining. Well, and, and just like um, an, an easy, easy follow-up is when you use for social justice, reach out for you to contact your uh, rep representatives on the Hill. Um, send them a letter, send them an email, mention this pull this into your contacts with them. That, that It really does go a long way. I'm Bill McPherson from University Unitarian Church in Seattle. That's Duwamish country. I'm also with the board of UUMFE. Okay, um, Kathy. Hi, uh, Kathy Ehlers, Minneapolis. I apologize, I'm going to have to get off of the call, but I want to at least make a brief appearance. I'm finishing up my capstone in grad school today and I don't have time to hang around, but I'll watch for the recording and I'll be involved in future meetings. Thanks so much for your convening. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, next is um, Jerry followed by Mike Carberry. Go ahead, Jerry. Hi, I'm Jerry Wagnon. I am a member of the UU Church of the Brazos Valley in Bryan College Station, Texas. Thank you and welcome. Mike, followed by Eileen. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, Mike Carberry from the UU Church in Iowa City, Iowa. Uh, and I'm glad to be back. I was uh, your presenter few weeks back on uh, wind power in the state of Iowa. So really good to see everybody here for Solutionary Rail. Thank you. Eileen followed, be, followed by Traveling Free Something. Hi, I'm Eileen Gettings. I'm with the Boise Unitarian Universalist Fellowship and a member of our climate action team there. Wonderful, welcome. Traveling Free followed by Hi. Cross. Hi. Hi, I'm Susan Singh. I'm from UUCB in Kensington, California. Awesome, welcome. Thank um, you. Steve, followed by um, Paul. Yeah, I'm in Atos. Okay, um, Paul, followed by Stan. Paul Ballinger at UU Central Whidbey Island, Washington State. 
<coughs> hey, Stan, Stan, followed by Amelia, if you're still here. I'm here. I'm still here for now, at least. I'm uh, from First Two in Portland, First Unitarian. Uh, well, I live nearby. <laughs> okay, but um, Amelia, are you still on? Huh? Yeah, I'm still on. Um, yeah, hi everyone, Amelia with UU Ministry for Earth, um, Calm Support, and also Young Adults for Climate Justice, calling from Ann Arbor, Michigan, um, and also not sure if I can stay on the whole time, but good to see you. And, and tell us your exciting news for the fall. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, I'm going to grad school uh, for a master's in environmental humanities at the University of Utah, so... Also, we'll have, yeah, projects to work on <laughs> and to climb it. And all these great newsletters you get from UU Ministry for Earth, Amelia is, em Amelia's the it person. She makes all those happen. One of many. <laughs> well, and Doris well, does so much behind the scenes, and Bill, and a lot of folks, yeah. Okay, um, thank, <laughs> thank you. Okay, Leslie followed by Beck. We're just, okay, um, Beck, are you still with us? I am still here. I am Beck okay. Mordini. I am at Mount Vernon Unitarian Church in Alexandria, Virginia, and been working with uh, Doris's team on our project Drawdown. Thank you, thank you. Um, Leslie, and then I think that's it. I, I don't think I've missed anybody after Leslie. Burkett from uh, Denton, Texas, uh, with the um, Denton Universalist Unitarian Fellowship. Thank you so much.